Okay, um, welcome to my talk, Modeling Omnidirectional Connectivity with QGIS and Omniscape. I know it's a mouthful. Hopefully it makes sense when I'm done. Um, yeah, I, I work with Septima in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm American, as I probably sound, but I've been living in Denmark for four years now. And uh, I do spatial analysis and cartography and teaching, et cetera. But a big part of my GIS career has been working with conservation GIS. And so this has been a really exciting project that I've been working on most of this year that I'm excited to uh, share with you. And I know I've kind of pounded this to death over the last two days, but I just want to let you know that we're going to have a informal book launch at the next coffee break. So if you're interested in celebrating with us, be there. So uh, this is the study area for the analysis I'm going to talk to you about. It's around um, Lake Superior in the U.S. So it's basically um, the north, it gets called the North Woods or the Laurentian Forest Province. So it's parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, so it's quite large and quite a wild area with populations of wolves and lots of other carnivores and deer and beaver. And um, so this is a project I did for a nonprofit called uh, the Superior Bioconservancy that works on protecting um, this area. So the goals for this were to identify structural connectivity. And so that means connectivity that's not for a specific species, but just kind of landscape level connectivity um, weighted towards riparian corridors. And specifically, we wanted to model omnidirectional connectivity. So that just means the connectivity for every pixel in the landscape, not a least cost path or something like that. And to get a qualitative assessment of the connectivity. So there's a lot of words for these corridors, linkages, but we wanted to identify the linkages between public forest lands to identify as, as, as eventually uh, private parcels that would be important to protect and to pro use this data to prioritize protection and campaigns and eventually to engage citizen scientists to conduct on the ground research um, for a number of reasons. What I'm going to show you is a, is a model. It's uh, not reality, so it needs to be ground truth. And in the long term, we hope to develop um, a plan to incentivize protection of private parcels by selling carbon offset credits. That's a very long term goal. So a little bit of linkage modeling 101. So there's a lot of different techniques people have developed over the years to identify how a critter gets from habitat block A to habitat block B. Um, least cost path, which many people have probably heard of, least cost corridor. And then there's, um, in newer and recent years, these electric circuit theory methods. All of these techniques use this thing called a resistance surface. And that's essentially just a data set where every pixel represents the, the ease of movement through the landscape or how much resistance or how much flow you'd expect in that. So a city is going to have higher resistance for the natural world than a forest, for example. So this is a nice visualization of what a resistance surface might look like. So the raster itself just has a bunch of cell values. The higher the cell value, the higher the resistance, the lower the value, the lower the resistance. And so if we're trying to model how to get from this habitat area to this habitat area, um, historically, we might have done what's called a least cost path analysis, which isn't necessarily the, the shortest path, but it's the one with the least cost between those two areas. The problem with this technique is that it's only one pixel wide. And in my case, that's 30 meters. And it doesn't really represent reality on the ground. Um, and it may not model for if you're working on a specific species that may be too narrow or too wide for that species. Um, and so moving on, people have also developed least cost corridor with takes a wider swath of pixels between these two areas. But in our case, we weren't even interested in modeling connectivity between different areas. We wanted to just me measure general connectivity across 
the entire study area, irrespective of target pixels, essentially. So we use this uh, Omniscape JL. I'd used its predecessor quite often, which is called CircuitScape. Um, so this software is used specifically to produce maps of omnidirectional connectivity. It's written in Julia. And it was developed by the Nature Conservancy, which is a big American nonprofit that focuses on conservation. Um, and it's built on CircuitScape, which is the underlying algorithm. And so it can be used with continuous data. Uh, I mean, you don't have to have these um, target blocks that you're trying to model connectivity between. You can, so we can use land cover or species richness, both of which we wanted to use. Um, so it's really useful in our situation where we're not trying to measure discrete A to B connectivity. And this is a diagram from the user manual of Omniscape, and it is a good way to describe how it works. It's a moving pixel analysis where it goes pixel by pixel, and for every one, it identifies uh, source pixels. So source pixels would be those. Um, technically, it requires two inputs. Um, a resistance raster and also a source strength. But for us, we ended up, there's an option to use the inverse of resistance as your source strength raster, which is what I did. So you can then set a threshold for pixel values that would be source targets. And you can, the software will go and search for target pixels within a specified search radius. And so um, in my case, I used eight kilometers as the search radius, which turned out to be a nice generic, since we're not modeling for species specific, um, we had no literature to base a specific distance on, but this was a kind of the mean distance between a lot of the um, public protected areas. And it also was a happy medium in runtime, increasing this, you know, up to 10, 12, 15 kilometers results in model run times of weeks or months instead of days. As it is with eight kilometers on my big workstation, it was taking uh, five, six days to run the model, do an iteration. So this is what uh, typical Omniscape results look like. So instead of getting that least cost path, you end up with the brightest areas being the the highest connections, and you end up with some places being kind of large homogenous areas of generally high connectivity. And then you end up with the kind of the classic dendritic linkages. So it really ends up modeling the true complexity of nature quite well. So this is the resistant surface that I developed. Um, it doesn't look like much when we're zoomed out. Um, but when we zoom in, you can see that there's a town and some highways that act as barriers in here. So this was built up using um, reclassifying land cover data um, and combining that with some um, road barriers, which I was able to remove um, bridges that cut over uh, rivers, which would be the connection through that uh, barrier adding riparian corridors buffered by 300 meters and then protected areas. And actually I also baked in some um, species richness data to this resistant surface. This is what the output, the, the main output of Omniscape uh, looked like in the final run. This is called the cumulative current flow, this output. So basically every pixel has a measure of the flow that runs through that particular pixel. And again, when we're looking at the whole study area, you can definitely see the area around Green Bay, Wisconsin um, being red and not having a lot of flow through it. Um, and then you can see the, the wild areas up here generally having good flow. And if we zoom in, you can see um, this is a, a, a barrier here, a, a major highway, but there's a bridge where this river undercuts. And the software can identify that then as a kind of a critical linkage. Um, you can identify pinch points, in other words, because you're getting the qualitative measure of the connectivity through that area. So we ended up calling this, in other terms, 
landscape permeability. Just trying, we've been trying to come up with words just to make this more digestible to the general public and policymakers to try to understand what this is, because it gets a little nerdy if you dive too deep into the details with decision makers. Um, another thing it, it produces is normalized current flow, and you can, there's some um, rules for extracting data out of that based on the mean value uh, or the, the um, based on the standard deviation of the data. And so you can extract out uh, channelized high quality and medium quality linkages from that other output of the software, which is raster, but I ended up vectorizing it for this purpose. And um, so we can see, you know, the intense network of channelized connections through here. And then we also had some big areas here that had generally high quality connections across the whole area. We ended up just pulling these out and calling them core reserves, regions of high connectivity. If we zoom into another area, you can really see that uh, dendritic pattern for the linkages. And, you know, we have, this is a national forest and we have some riparian linkages across this highway barrier. And you can see how many different options there are for, you know, connectivity between these different areas, which I think models reality on the ground quite well, but also in terms of implementation, gives planners options for what may be uh, lower hanging fruit to protect and what may be more difficult. Some places may have better opportunities. So another part of this was this organization, the, the Superior Bioconservancy, had a student intern a number of years ago who um, aggregated a bunch of beaver statistics by watershed. Uh, but it was a small area. So I repeated what he did, but for the watersheds across the entire area, beaver are a keystone species that are very important to a functional ecosystem. And so we wanted to incorporate um, data on beaver um, with this analysis. And so these are all the statistics that I uh, generated by watershed, including this potential beaver population, which is a fairly simple algorithm that's basically based on river miles and land use, subtracting out some of the urban areas. So it's a very simple metric, but has been documented as generally being a sound measure of potential beaver habitat in a watershed. So this allowed us to generate maps like this. Um, in the US, there's multiple levels of watersheds. So this is kind of generally the coarsest level that would be useful at this scale. Um, Huck eight watersheds, hydrologic unit codes. So we can color these from the highest potential beaver population to the lowest across the study area. And we can zoom in to the next level watershed. So I aggregated these statistics by three different levels of watershed, getting more detailed all the way down to the Huck 12. So I then went in and um, developed this and the connectivity as two separate web maps. So this data is available to the general public to explore. So you can scan this QR code and open up this web map that allows you to explore the, the Beaver data. And I'm going to um, give you a demo of both websites in a second. Um, we built this on our Septima widget, um, which is kind of a wrapper sitting around open layers. We used uh, vector tiles and um, for the, I'll get to the next one, vector tiles for most of that. And then we also developed um, a site for the connectivity linkage mapping. And so for this, those the results of that analysis with the, the core reserves, the critical linkages, high quality linkages, all those different classes of linkage, um, I aggregated by those same watersheds. And um, so we have all of this data available by watershed in the linkage web map. And here's what this will look like. And there's a QR code for this site as well. This site is still a little bit in beta. There's still a few more things um, that it needs, but it's working pretty well. So I'm going to get out of this and 
demo this. So this is the linkage map. I'm using a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF for this big uh, cumulative core Omniscape output raster. Um, and so we have a toggle here for turning layers off and on, so I can turn on the forests and the protected lands. We've tried to make this as simple as possible so the general public can navigate it quite well. Um, so it, it scales fairly well. Um, pretty happy with the functionality of the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF at this point, and more and more data becomes available as you zoom in, and you can see the um, results of that output for specific areas. And so because um, people are going to be kind of have a pet watershed or an area that they're probably interested in, we've added a, a search up here for sub-watershed. So I can um, search for a watershed. So for example, um, I had to uh, aggregate these by county and state because there's a lot of rep repetition here of uh, watershed names. But I can go to, uh, where's the one I want to go to? Yeah, the Silver River. And so when you choose that, it zooms and pans to that watershed. And we have the full range of layers in here now. And we can turn off the landscape permeability and turn on the linkages for this area and the core reserves. Uh, but what's more interesting, we can also investigate the data a little bit by clicking on one of these uh, watersheds and getting the summary statistics in this little pop-up that shows the acreage of this watershed and then the potential beaver population, which is quite high at 334, and the acres of core reserve, critical linkage, high-quality linkage, and all of that. Um, and it becomes quite interesting um, if we go to the other Silver River watershed in here. It's not too far away. It's just the next state over. And um, it also has um, quite a high uh, beaver population of 499. And we, what we've discovered um, is that these tend to mirror each other. There's a correlation if a watershed has a generally high potential beaver population, it generally has a lot of um, areas of linkage and core reserve in it as well, uh, which is not terribly surprising. There's one layer that's not showing up, so there's a little bug here. That We also have um, impaired waters here, and, and I was hoping to be able to show that this watershed actually has a lot of impaired streams in it, which means these are streams that don't meet um, the U.S. Clean Water Act requirements for various um, nutrients and uh, so that they uh, need a, a watershed plan to restore that. So we, you, know, you can kind of get some good information um, here about that. And then we can go over to the, the beaver web map. And again, this one is going to scale as we zoom in. So if we zoom in, the, the it's going to automatically zoom into the next one. Oh, that's right. The, the uh, impaired streams are in this map. So let me do that same search for the, the Silver River. This one operates the same way as the uh, connectivity map. So if I zoom into that Silver River watershed I was just looking at in the other one, um, we get all this information here about that's more beaver-centric with um, the percentage of beaver suitable vegetation, um, percentage of wetland and forest, which would be beaver, suitable uh, land uses. And if we go over to the uh, the other one, this is where we'll be able to see the impaired streams. And so you can see um, this one may be in need of higher priority because not only does it have potential high beaver and lots of connectivity, as we can see from the other map, but it has um, some impaired streams in it as well. And we've also um, gone in and for both of these maps um, incorporated some um, aerial photography from the USGS so that you can zoom in and you know get a more detailed view of some of these areas. So that is the the, the you know a, a very quick snapshot on a very long analysis. Um, we have a lot of ideas for 
applications for this project. Um, this is kind of the, the foundation of this longer campaign to try to develop some prioritization schemes for protection of these various areas and to start working to outreach with tribes and other landowners um, and eventually develop this um, scheme to sell carbon offset credits to protect some of these areas and, and other methods of protecting uh, this land. Uh, but at least now all this data is out there and available to the world to explore and use. And so it's our way of kind of just sharing um, the results of this with the agencies and everyone else, because it's the first analysis like this that's been done in the region. And so it um, should be quite valuable information to a lot of different stakeholders. So, and with that, that's the end. Thank you for the interesting presentation. My question is, uh, do you think this is applicable for walkability of a city? Mm -hmm. And can you elaborate? <laughs> so can you repeat the first part of that? Uh, if this is applicable for walkability analysis of a city or town for people. Oh, it, it certainly could be. You would just have to reweight your resistance surface to represent walkability, you know? So, um, just ask for documentation. Let's... Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a, you can go to the Julia website. If you just Google, um, or not Julia, I mean, if you Google Omniscape, there's a GitHub page, it's open source. So you can um, go to circuitscape.org slash Omniscape and read about how the algorithm works, and you can link to the GitHub page from here. But it would work in any environment. It, the, the, the situation would just be to give it the input data that's going to represent the connections that you're trying to model. Um, hi, uh, interesting project. Um, just a few quick questions. How do you get to the resistance surface? There has to be a lot of domain knowledge going into... Yeah, it's a lot of work with um, a like raster calculator and, and, and you know, formatting a, a, a raster layer that has all of these... To so have a raster pipeline before that yeah. which generates the resistance surface based yeah. on some preconceptions how animals yeah basically uh, we, we use some some documentation in the literature for how um, people have weighted the land cover data before for this kind of analysis yeah. and uh, we also incorporated since we wanted a more riparian focus we ended up weighting those areas heavier and we probably went through 30 different model runs testing the output until we were happy with um, what we were seeing um, and now it has to be ground truth, of course. Uh, and um, the last two quick, uh, there is um, a modeling infrastructure for Julia called Agents GL. Mm. And I know it eats uh, raster data or even OSM data. Is there a possibility or ha have you toyed with the idea of, um, of modeling animal movements on the surface you have, or using the, the surface you have uh, um, calculated as canvas. Yeah, yeah, that would be very interesting. And I, I've, I've done that kind of modeling on species-specific scenarios before. And, uh, you know, the, the challenge is always just, again, being able to represent um, how that species sees the world and, and what its movement uh, requirements are, and how do you represent that with data. Okay, yeah. And quickly, Julia and QGIS and or Julia and GIS in general, pain in the ass or going along together? Well, I, they were two just completely in different environments for me. So I, I ran this, mo I created the disconnect the distance raster in, in QGIS and then um, ran Julia um, via the command line. Yeah. So, and it was quite easy to do. And then I viewed the output, which is a GeoTIFF but, in QGIS. You know, GIS data types in Julia are there any, is there any infrastructure to read raster data or work with that or anything? Or is um, it, you know? it seems to accept any any generally widely used raster format like GeoTIFF. Okay. Um, it, it was fine. Or even a um, ASCII raster. 
So there's some connectivity to it, it, yeah, it may it may be using GDAL in there, but I'm not uh, really okay. sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more question. But I, I should mention um Alexander Broy, who's a QGIS developer and has developed a lot of third-party processing plugins, um, years ago had developed uh, a CircuitScape plugin to connect QGIS to CircuitScape, and he just pinged me yesterday because he saw I was giving this talk, and he's going to um, enhance that plugin to work with Omniscape now. So um, that will be available. So that would be my question, Roger, is a, a way to bring in Julia to processing somehow or... Um, or yeah, it, it at least connect Q just to the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. and it, apparently there is. If you're Alexander Broy, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Kurt. Yeah. We get a lot of applause for Kurt.